Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Today we are outside and getting ready for Run For Hope. Yes. Mark and Jess here, and we hope that you can join us if you haven't already. Yes, go to menlo.church slash run for hope. If you haven't signed up yet, you still can. Every mile you walk, Menlo Church donating money to our local first responders. Each campus has connected with different, um, you know, police officers and firefighters and other local first responders to figure out what it is they need, how can we support them. And so we have some really cool ways that we're gonna be able to do that and just really just encourage them. That's the bottom line. Right, Yeah. I heard that because of this, we're actually able to start and pilot a mental health services for one of our local so first responders. I know. So good. So great, right? So again, we'd love to encourage you to do this with us. Sign up online, log your hours, and log your time. Put that in, and we would love for you to do this with us yes. churchwide. Uh, so wait until after the service is done <laughs> to do that. So right now, let's go ahead and jump inside the house for some worship. Light in the dark 
Well, we hope you enjoyed that worship set from our Around the Table series, which is our Lent series. Yep. And the culmination of Lent is Easter. And so we want to let you know about all the cool things happening for Holy Week. We've got services on Monday, Thursday, in person at Menlo Park and streamed online. We've got services for Good Friday in person at Menlo Park and Mountain View, also streamed online. Mm -hmm. And our Easter Sunday services are going to be in person and online for the first time in Years, yeah. I think so super excited for that um, go to menlo.church slash Easter to get all of those details find out all the service times at your local campus we'll also be right here online on YouTube at starting at 8 a.m. for on demand or we'd love to invite you to join us for live chat prayer fun conversation at 9 and 10 30 a.m. on our church online platform again this is just a great way to celebrate Jesus resurrecting from the dead. So again, menlo.church slash Easter for all the details that I just spewed at you. That was so much. You did <laughs> so such much. a great job. Again, <laughs> thank you, thank menlo.church slash Easter. And this is all made possible by your generosity. Because of it, we can do things like Run for Hope. Yeah. We can organize a ton of Holy Week services and we can do things like support our local communities. For example, the San Jose campus right now is opening up their safe car park for the whole month of March. This is where people that are experiencing homelessness can come. 
park their cars, have a safe place to stay at night, get a hot meal every week, and just a great way for us to be in our communities making a difference. So uh, I want to share one story. Okay. They have about 30 volunteers there, which is a great story in itself. It's huge, yeah. Yes. But there is one person that talked with someone that was using the service, and as they were conversating, that person told them that they were cold at night sleeping in their car. So our volunteer went home, gathered about five sleeping bags, wow. came back and distributed them, and now they have a program that's going to collect sleeping bags. So, that's so great. Really awesome. I mean, this is all made possible, again, by your generosity. And if you've been like us and are continuing to pray for Ukraine and that's on your heart, you can also donate to our Disaster Relief Fund as well. So tons of information. I know you can follow the directions on the screen and participate in the life change that's going on right here at Menlo Church. That's awesome. All right, well, we're gonna head inside for our preaching by Adam Hendricks for Around the Table. Uh, I think we're week three now, so let's yeah. check that out. But before we do, oh. we gotta stop by the kitchen oh, yes. because I'm making y'all a dish. Ooh, let's go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Missy. And I'm Mark, I'm part of the Church Online team here, and thank you for joining us as we are journeying around the table, feasting through the Gospel of John. Today, we will feast indeed. What are we making? Your new favorite potluck appetizer item. AKA the sushi bake. Let's get into it. First thing we have to do is heat the oven to 425. We're gonna cook rice in a pot. All you gotta do is wash your rice until it's not milky anymore. And then measuring with our first digit pinky nail, we're gonna cook it on our stove top. While the rice is cooking, combine rice vinegar, sugar, and salt in a small saucepan and warm over low heat. And then in a bowl, we're gonna mix the crab with the cream cheese and the mayo until it is smooth, setting that aside as well. When the rice is done, we're gonna transfer it to a very large bowl. We're gonna sprinkle on the vinegar mixture and use a rice paddle called a chameau or a spatula to mix the rice vinegar into the rice. Now we get to spread the sushi rice into an oven safe baking dish with the top half of it covered in furikake. Uh, next, we're gonna top it with cream cheese mayo, crab mix, and sprinkle on the remaining furikake. We're gonna bake the whole thing for 15 minutes or until the top just begins to brown and bubble and the whole rice is warmed through. Well, we hope that you enjoyed the sushi bake. Enjoy it with friends or family and thank you so much for being with us. Hello everyone, if we've never met before, my name is Adam and I'm one of the pastors here and I hope you've been following with us through our Lent series called Around the Table. And I also hope you've grabbed a Lent devotional. Uh, you've been listening to our Menlo Midweek podcast and are journeying with us every day because I love this series, mainly because I love food. I come about this love honestly because my family loves food. In my family, food was the answer for every problem. You look a little tired. Have you eaten anything? Why are you so grumpy? You should eat something. Big test coming up, better eat a lot. <laughs> On vacations, we don't plan around sights to see. We plan around food to try. Uh, when I visit both my grandmas, they always have my favorite foods ready to go. And, and we're not talking about California food here, fruit, tofu, whatever quinoa is supposed to be. We're talking Southern food. On one side, my grandma always has fried okra ready. Now, if you've never had fried okra, go ahead and stop listening to the sermon right now. Drive to the South and eat some fried okra and come back filled with the spirit. Uh, on the other side is my all-time favorite, salmon fritters. <laughs> You're not gonna find this recipe in a Martha Stewart cookbook. This manna from heaven is made from canned salmon and fried dough, created out of necessity from poor Southern folk. Now, maybe you're wondering why I didn't include this recipe in our Lent devotional. Because if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Uh, but my family's right. Food is the perfect prescription. When I eat these foods, it makes me feel better. You know what I'm talking about, right? What do we call these foods? Comfort foods. These foods comfort us and soothe our anxieties. They warm our souls. In my case, they probably clog some arteries. 
But food's not the only thing we go to for comfort, right? We all have appetites and cravings and desires for things that soothe us and make us fulfilled. Some of us crave a good show to binge. Others long for a few minutes on social media, which might turn into 30 minutes of doom scrolling. We hunger for sexual or emotional satisfaction. We hunger for validation from our peers. Some of us crave the adrenaline rush or the importance that working overtime can bring. Humans have appetites and cravings and desires. To hunger and thirst is to be human. The problem is when we overindulge these cravings and hungers. The definition of self-indulgence is excessive or unrestrained gratification of one's own appetites, desires, or whims. Now, when we look at our culture, and our friends, and ourselves, I wonder if we are in a world and a kingdom of self-indulgence. A group of people numbing and filling ourselves with every hunger and comfort. But sometimes, sometimes we lose our appetite. If you had a loved one in Ukraine a few weeks ago, I'm guessing you got sick to your stomach and you lost your appetite. Last week, my friend got a call from her son's elementary school letting her know that they needed to put him on suicide watch. He's seven. I'm guessing she lost her appetite. When it comes to love and concern for others, the last thing we want to do is indulge ourselves. We lose our hunger out of love for another. The day I was proposing to my girlfriend, spoiler alert, now wife, I was restless. I wanted everything to be perfect. I placed candles around the piano in the church where I'd sing a song I wrote for her. I made sure all my friends were ready for a surprise later. I booked the dinner reservation. But during the meal, I barely touched my food. Knowing if I did, I'd probably vomit. Why? My love, my passion, my concern was for her was so important, it overwhelms everything else. I was nervous and restless and uncomfortable, but I felt a greater desire, a more important aspiration. What if you are being called to a more important aspiration? What if God is is whispering to you that there's something more than a life of self-indulgence and comfort, a life of indulging your appetite? It's a whisper of adventure and mission, a vision of a life that's greater than fulfilling yourself, a life that's compelled and driven by hope and love. Jesus is whispering and inviting you. He's sending you on a mission that goes beyond self-indulgence. But we have to be honest with ourselves and answer a question. The question is this. Do you lose your hunger out of love for another? So let's dive into our text for today. We're picking up where we left off last week. Uh, While going through Samaria, the writer John says that Jesus was tired from the journey. His disciples went into town to buy food, so we can assume he was hungry and hadn't eaten anything for a while. Jesus has this legendary exchange with the Samaritan woman, and now we pick up the story as the disciples return. So we see this. Just then, his disciples return, and we're surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asks, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Good call, disciples. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be... Messiah. So this woman shares the good news uh, she just heard from Jesus. And it starts a revolution in her little town. A little later, John tells us that her sharing causes many Samaritans to believe in Jesus. Let's continue. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Now, the disciples here are like my grandmas and family. Out of concern, they say, eat something. You know how you can get 
We don't want him turning over tables or cursing fig trees. No one needs a hangry Messiah. Sometimes we make this mistake of forgetting Jesus' humanity. Being fully human means he experienced hunger and thirst. He felt pain. He had needs just like you and me. One way human needs are explained is by the use of a pyramid based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm betting many of you have seen or used this tool at some point in your life. And just like any hierarchy, it, it's a ranking system that shows importance. In this case, which needs are most important have to be fulfilled before having the motivation to pursue the next need. Before you get to belonging, love, or more transcendent qualities, you have to first meet your basic needs, physiological and safety needs. This is why my mom and grandmas were, were pretty brilliant. If there's a problem, it makes sense to first check on your most basic needs, like hunger. This is the order of humanity, the natural way of things, the order of the kingdom of this world. Now, Jesus was human. It was the time to fulfill his most basic need. But instead of eating, he says this strange thing. He said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And like what often happens with Jesus and his disciples, they think he's talking about a physical reality, but he's trying to teach them about a deeper spiritual reality. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now question, is Jesus saying he's not hungry anymore? No, he's making a statement of ranking, a statement of importance and value. His food, what fills him, the thing he needs most is to do the will and work of the Father. This is what he was sent to do by God. And this takes priority in the moment. Now the word will here is theloma in Greek. Theloma means a wish, a want, a, a desire. All humans have a will, our own hierarchy of motivations, things we want and desire. My will is to open a new campus of Menlo Church in Maui. I really see the need for Jesus there. The beaches are plentiful, but the workers are few. Here am I, send me Lord, <laughs> willing to suffer for your mission. We have a will, but so does God. Now, what is the will of the Father? What does God desire? The writer John uses the word theloma quite a bit. He writes in chapter 6, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. God's desire is to bring life and life eternal to seek and save the lost and bring them back into his fold like he originally intended. Now, how about God's work? Along with God's will, more important than physical food to Jesus is to finish God's work. Now, the Greek word here for work is ergon, meaning to labor, to be active. What is the work of God? The writer John says this again in chapter 6, the ergon, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Jesus has been sent. He's been given a divinely appointed mission to reveal God in a new way and to show everyone a new kingdom. This new kingdom is eternal and apparently it's not just for the Jewish tribe, but for outsiders and all people. It's a mission focused on others focused on loving and reaching and rescuing another. To believe in Jesus is to believe in God's plan and kingdom of shalom. This mission is more important to Jesus than physical food. The will and the work of the Father is what motivates him, not his own hunger. So back to Maslow's hierarchy. Do you see how brilliant this is? There's a system of ranking, a system of needs and priorities for humans. And what does Jesus do? He flips it upside down. 
Apparently, this kingdom is an alternative. It's an inversion, a subversion of the typical way of doing things. It's an upside-down kingdom. In Jesus' kingdom, there are things more important than our own cravings and desires and self-indulgence. In Jesus' kingdom, we submit our own will and work for the will and work of the Father. This kingdom is built on love and redemption for another. He is willing to lose his hunger out of love for another. But then Jesus shifts to talking about agriculture. He says, don't you have a saying? It's it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. So he's been sent by the Father to do the will and work of God, which is to seek and save the lost, those on the outside. And now he compares these people to a field that is ripe for this work, ripe and ready and prepared for this work and this news. I believe Jesus is saying the same thing to us. Open your eyes. Look at the fields. Look at Silicon Valley. If you're watching online, look at your local city. Look at our world. I don't have to read a ton of stats for you to know the pandemic accelerated changes that were already happening. Loneliness and isolation were already an epidemic. The pandemic just increased this reality. Church attendance and association with the religion was dwindling, and the pandemic accelerated this. Look at our church. How many friends of yours have given up on church. Empty seats and empty pews. Our church's average age continues to increase with young people missing. But interestingly, people are still hungry and searching, looking for deeper fulfillment. As levels of anxiety and depression and loneliness increase, people long for a deeper hope and contentment. I recently read this article about the New Age spiritual teacher Deepak Chopra. He holds these retreats that cost thousands to attend, and they're always full. In his words, people are flocking to these retreats. Chopra said people skip church to attend these retreats and stressed that the drop in religious observance may be raising questions about how how society is changing, but not about our spiritual nature. The spiritual experience will never go away, he said. And he's right. Crystals, meditation, astronomy, psychedelics, people are hungry. They're just looking to fill their hunger in different ways. They are ripe for harvest. And Jesus finishes his thought and says, Thus is saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Jesus, sent by the Father, now looks at the disciples and says, I sent you. Towards the end of the book of John, after Jesus had died and resurrected, he reemphasizes this point by saying, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus was sent on a divinely appointed mission, and then he sent others. And that sending continues to this day. In a post-Christian world in which every comfort and appetite is available to us, there's still a whisper to join this adventure, to take up a call to this mission, to help people find and follow Jesus, to forsake your hunger, to search for another. To lay down your will for the will of the Father. To leave your work and agenda and take on His work. To embrace discomfort and join the mission. Now maybe you're saying, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Or I don't want to push my faith on others. To which I say, Amen. (laughs) Me neither. Pushing our faith and beliefs on others is rarely, if ever, effective. You should see the verbal gymnastics I perform whenever I meet someone and they ask me what I do for a living. I'm a pastor, but I'm not going to weird you out. I'm I'm a good hang. 
I'm a cool pastor. I like what all the cool kids like. I like the TikTok. I like the charcuteries. I like the cryptocurrency. <laughs> it's not my fault that the only modern music I know comes from the movie Encanto. I'm being held hostage by three young kids. Some people think the work of inviting others to Jesus is only for professional pastors and church staff. The problem with this is I'm just a dude. My credentials don't make my story special. I'm a dude who has experienced his hunger and thirst quenched by this Jewish rabbi. We don't need professional evangelists. What we need are people that invite others to a table. We need people who take seriously the greatest commandments to love God and love others. And then we need these people to mold their lives around an upside down kingdom of love and invite those on the outside to come to this table. We need people like the Samaritan woman who compelled by Jesus simply says, come and see this man. And maybe for you, this could literally be inviting someone to a table to experience love and acceptance. Maybe it's an invite to help at one of our serving projects. We need people who ask the question, who is missing from this table? Who are the Samaritans? What ethnicities are missing? What age groups are missing? What socioeconomic groups are missing from our table? We need people who lose their hunger out of love for another. Because when someone we love dearly is not at the table, we lose our appetite. We can't indulge because our, our hurt, uh, our heart burns for them. We miss them. We yearn for their presence. In 1997, in China, uh, Guao Gangtang's two-year-old son was abducted from their home. The little one was trafficked and sold away. As a father, I can't imagine an experience like this. I don't want to, but I can't help but put myself in the shoes of this father. How would you continue life? How would you do normal, basic activities knowing that your beloved son is not here anymore and is missing? What would this table feel like knowing someone isn't there? In reality, Guao didn't continue on with normal activities. Instead, he bought a motorcycle. He created a big flag that had a picture of his son with words detailing what had happened. And he went searching for his missing son. For the next 24 years, he searched and searched. He traveled over 300,000 miles riding and handing out flyers. He went through 10 motorcycles during this time. Some nights he would sleep under overpasses. Some days he would go hungry. He used up all of his savings and he went into debt because he was compelled out of love. When someone is missing, you lose your appetite and your desires shift. At one point he said, only on the road I felt I'm a father. I have no reason to stop searching. It's impossible for me to stop. For 24 years, this was his work. During his search, he helped over 100 other children get connected with their parents. But it wasn't until last year, through improved DNA technology, that Guao's son was found. They were reunited in 2021. They were restored. The family whole again. We're in the Lent season which is a time to remember Jesus' journey to the cross. And the culmination of this journey is what we often call the passion of Jesus. Now, passion is a fascinating word. We use it a lot these days, usually saying things like, I'm passionate for salmon fritters. Music is my passion. Everyone needs to find their passion. But the, original, uh, the origin of the word comes from the Latin word passio and the Greek word pathos. Now, both of these words mean suffering. Passion isn't just something we enjoy or we're obsessed with. Passion is loving something so much we are willing to suffer for it. 
to get uncomfortable for it, to forsake ourselves for it. So Jesus looked around the table and he realized there were sons and daughters missing. And he couldn't bear to not have you at the table. He abandoned his own hunger and appetites and physical needs, and he went on a journey of passion for you. And this is what he was sent to do. This was the will and the work of the Father to redeem and restore and bring shalom back to the table, the family whole again. At the end of this journey of passion, Jesus says, now now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. The ultimate subversion, flipping of hierarchies, he gave up his entire self out of love for another. He sacrificed all his needs out of love for another, for you. Now he's whispering to us, come join me on this mission. Join me on this grand adventure built on passion. Imagine waking up each day with purpose, knowing every conversation, every interaction is filled with meaning because each moment is a chance to invite others to a kingdom of love. Imagine not being consumed with making more money or proving yourself to others, but laying your will down taking up an eternal work as deeply fulfilling. Open your eyes, look at the fields. The harvest is riper than ever. There are people missing from the table and they're hungry. As the father sent his son, now he is sending you. Will you forsake your comfort? Will you lose your hunger out of love for another? Let's pray together. Father, we remember today that you have a mission. You have a will. You have work. And we remember that you sent your son during this season. We remember the journey, the sacrifice to the cross. And how it was for each of us, out of love, out of passion, compelled So as we journey together in this Lent season, would you give us gratefulness? Would you help us remember the sacrifice and this love that draws us? And then also, would you compel us? Would you help us see that this mission continues, that there are people missing from the table of our church, missing from uh, the kingdom of love? And would you just give us great, great passion for these folks? Would you show us how to love? Show us how to live a life that is worthy of your calling. In each moment, uh, would you help us invite others to be a part, to be back at the table with you? So we thank you. Would you send us out as a church and help us live a life of mission? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. can separate us you are for me what can stand against us your love it won't let go i know it won't darkness shadows have no power over me fear is empty shame has no Healing and freedom as you speak, babe.
no, no, no. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for our service, and we hope that we could continue to connect with you throughout the week. You can do so by texting us. We'd love to pray for you or encourage you. Go ahead and do so by texting the number on the screen. You can connect with us on YouTube. We've got some amazing resources there, like some of our worship videos from this Around the Table series. Uh, there's also a podcast that we're super excited about. Check out the Menlo Church Sermons podcast for a midweek deep dive with our speaker each week. And again, get out, walk, run, skip for hope. Do so now and I'll see you next week. Bye.